Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today we have the feast of Pope St. Martin I. Um, I held the papacy from the year 649 to 655, and he was uh, quite an important figure in the development of the primacy of the chair of St. Peter. Uh, we take it for granted that the, the head of the Catholic Church is the Pope in Rome, there's the Vatican, um, everybody knows, right, the Pope is the head of the Church. Uh, but he, it wasn't always this way. We, we really... Um, you know, it, it was that was not always understood. That ha, that developed actually over time. That understanding of the primacy of the, the pope, at least in the eyes of the world. Uh, and so, some um, some background first, right? So we have Pope Martin. We'll talk about him in the year six fifty, six fifty, right? Is when he had had the papacy. Uh, but recall, a few days ago, we celebrated the dedication of the Archbasilica of our Savior, uh, Saint John Lateran. This is the first church publicly consecrated by the Pope Saint Sylvester. Until that time, the church has always been underground, or at least subdued. And uh, until then, it, nobody cared who the head of the church was, right? Except people in the church, right? It was just a non-issue. Uh, the Caesars, the emperors, they did recognize the pope then as uh, the head of the church. Uh, but then when the, when the papacy uh, began to operate in the open, uh, after the year 324, right? Uh, it was one year prior to the Council of Nicaea. Uh, now it began to attract the attention of the emperors, and that brought its own share of problems. So especially when the um, um, Constantine moved the capital of the empire to uh, Constantinople, uh, and then the patriarch of Constantinople became the, one of the emperor's uh, greatest, you know, closest advisor. And so then you had kind of that, that was the first, I guess you could say, um, uh, not, not, not attack uh, on the primacy of the, uh, of the pope, but a, the, the weakening of its understanding. Because now, you know, the, the, the emperor has recognized the extreme importance of the church in, in the life of the empire. And so the patriarchs, uh, you know, and, and the, the popes, the, the leaders of the church were very powerful, became very powerful political figures as well. And so that put pressure, that, that put pressure on them to agree with the emperor, or at least to make, when they're making religious decisions, uh, not to do so that would cause division in the kingdom or, or headaches uh, for, for the emperor in, in the economic, social, financial, whatever it may be. And the emperors, of course, they're not concerned with the religious matters. They're concerned about those civil matters. Um, and so as the Constantinople being the seat of the empire for the next uh, hundreds, hundreds of years, right, from like three 300 years, Rome was secondary. It was a secondary imperial city although it retained its religious primacy uh, in the church, but in the eyes of the emperors, that was not the case, right? They viewed the patriarch of Constantinople as the head of the church, and it ended up usually the patriarch always agreed with the emperor, especially because the emperors very often chose the patriarch, and even sometimes the popes of Rome. Uh, in fact, uh, papal elections were not the rule until the year 1000 and later. Uh, popes uh, very often chose their successors, uh, but after doing so, the emperor had to give his official seal of approval to the new pope. And so this began to weaken around the time of Pope St. Martin. Uh, the the uh, papacy, especially under the influence of St. Gregory the Great, uh, be, uh, began to assert itself uh, as the, the prime seat of, of the church, not Constantinople. It was the pope, and it was, it was there in Rome. Uh, so Gregory the Great, uh, you know, laid, laid the foundations for that, and that continued, you know, with some hiccups here and there. Uh, but before, prior to Pope Martin I, uh, we have Pope John IV and his successor, Pope Theodore I. And those two popes really began the break away from Constantinople. And it was centered around the monothelite heresy, the monothelitism heresy, which is arguing over the um, uh, how many wills are in Christ. Does, does he has a human will. Uh, does he have a divine will as well? Uh, how can you have two wills? How can you have you know, a human will, a divine will? How is it possible? Similar, right, to mono, monophysitism, uh, Arianism, it was all these early Christological heresies trying to understand the interplay between the divine and man. Uh, the answer, as you can tell from the monothelitist heresy, uh, one will, uh, that's a heresy for a reason. Christ does not have one will, he has two. He's fully man, fully God, and God has a divine will, and every human person has a human will, and so that those two were present in Christ. Uh, so th th this was the the um, heresy at the time, and this is what was controversial with the popes. And so John the Fourth, Theodore the First, were 
uh, struggling with the emperors there in Byzantine and the, and the patriarch against this heresy. Uh, they were condemning it, the emperors variously, because they were, again, looking at factions, supported the heresy, wanted it to be promoted, and were irritated at the popes in Rome who were putting religious matters over civil matters, right, as they should have been. So Pope Martin, what's, what's his role in all this? So uh, he was born in Italy to, no, to noble parents. He had received an education up in the order of St. Basil as a youth. I think he, he was uh, actually joined the order. But he ended up in the service of the papacy as a legate. He went on missions into Greece and Turkey, uh, and he served both John IV and Pope Theodore I. So uh, at the time of Theodore, um, there was a, con that was a um, conflict with the emperor, and Theodore had called a council. He had put in place, or rather the plans, to call a council. And he died, and before he died, he named Pope Martin I as his successor. And so Pope Martin I took that in the year 649, and this is at the height of interference of Byzantine emperors. Um, the previous emperors, the previous patriarchs, had, uh, as I mentioned, were supporting monothelitism. And the latest uh, decree from the emperor was that everybody just basically forget the whole thing. Uh, it's just the, the emperor issued a decree that all discussion of the matter should cease. Whatever people believed before the controversy, just keep believing that same thing, and everybody just pretend like nothing happened, right? That's what, that's what the, the current Byzantine emperor wanted. Not sufficient when you're talking about the highest matters of theology. And so Pope Martin, after being named uh, by his, his predecessor, Theodore, did not wait for the usual approval by the Byzantine emperor, but proceeded with his coronation uh, his papal coronation immediately. And furthermore, he called the, uh, he convoked, convened that synod in Rome, that, that, that council that Theodore had been planning. Pope Martin goes right along with it, doesn't consult the emperor, doesn't ask for his permission, and this was the Lateran Council of 649. Uh, in this council, the monothelite heresy is condemned, along with the writings of the Patriarch of Constantinople, and also the edicts of several of the previous Byzantine emperors. So quite a bold move on the part of Pope Martin I to exert uh, the primacy of the Pope of Rome in such a, we could say, even spectacular fashion. So he informs the current emperor of these decisions after the fact, uh, who hadn't given his approval, hadn't been consulted, and not only does he inform him, he's very bold and asks for his support uh, as, the, as the Pope of Rome, support these decrees. And this was, uh, I guess, quite the bold move, quite the unexpected move. And the emperor responds by issuing uh, a, a warrant for Pope Martin's arrest. And that was carried out not immediately due to the difficulty of distance and of uh, uh, politics, but eventually successful. Martin I was arrested. He was carried off to Constantinople, and he was where he was condemned and banished uh, into exile, where eventually he died after nearly uh, two years. Uh, but he succeeded in that brief time uh, in, in the papacy of four, some five years, in sending the message to the Byzantine emperors and to all the faithful in the world that the Pope is the head of the church, not the emperor, not the patriarch of Constantinople, not any other religious leader. And you cannot arrest, torture, or force the church into submission. And we'll see that, uh, that other popes afterwards were emboldened by St. Martin's example. Uh, his successor, you know, continued in, his, in, in that courage. And so that's a great example, right? A great example from the Bishop of Rome and to the bishops of Rome. This is what popes should be like, standing up against evil in dark times to uphold the truth, even at great personal cost, right? Pope Martin could have quietly condemned the heresy. He could have pushed it off for someone else to do. You know, he could have done all a number of things that would be more politically expedient, but he took it upon himself to take on, uh, take on that heresy uh, uh, fa right, head on, uh, face to face. And he paid the price. He paid the price with his life, with exile, and he also received the reward, an eternal crown in heaven and perpetual remembrance in the church for all time as a hero for Christ. Uh, Pius the seventh, uh, five, six, yeah, seventh, praises him in his encyclical uh, Dius Satis, and that was given in, in the 1800s. And I'd like to read from this and also from the Byzantine breviary, uh, praising him for his efforts. And, and this is really what we need these days more than anything. So let's see, um, an encyclical says, The famous Martin, who long ago won great praise for the Holy See, commends faithfulness and fortitude to all popes by his strengthening and defense of the truth and by the endurance of labors and pains. He was driven from his see and from the city, 
stripped of his rule, his rank, and his entire fortune. As soon as he arrived in any peaceful place, he was forced to move. Despite his advanced age and an illness which prevented his walking, he was banished to a remote land and repeatedly threatened with an even more painful exile. Without the assistance offered by the generosity of the pious faithful, he would not even have had food for himself and his few attendants. Although he was tempted daily in his weakened and lonely state, he never surrendered his integrity. No deceit could trick him, no fear perturb him, no promise conquer him, no difficulties or dangers break him. His enemies could extract from him no sign which would not prove to all that Peter, until this time and forever, lives in his successors and exercises clear judgment in every age. The Byzantine Breviary praises him with the following titles. Pope St. Martin I, Glorious Definer of the Orthodox Faith, Sacred Chief of Divine Dogmas, Unstained by Error, True Reprover of Heresy, Foundation of Bishops, Pillar of the Orthodox Faith, Teacher of Religion. Uh, what an excellent example. What a legacy. Right? This is something that we can uh, uh, pray for, but this is something we can look back on. Right? We, we get caught up in the kind of the horror of our own moments, and we forget holy popes who have preceded us. And here we go. Pope St. Martin right, is, is definitely one of them. Uh, and he, he, So he's an example. Right? He, we can remember him. There are, were good, holy, strong, courageous, fearless popes in the past. There will be some in the future, right? at least until the end of time. Uh, and and that, that, can, that can reassure us when we're tempted either to, to um, not doubt the faith, but doubt the providence of God or be fearful, whatever it is, but even ourselves. right? We may be, we're, we're tempted to take the easy way out. We want other people to be bold. But it's hard for us when it's our turn, when we have to be bold and we have to take the hit. We have to suffer something for Christ. You know, we don't remember the times where we failed. Uh, but let us be bold right now. Let us not shrink in the face of dangers or become negligent in our confession of Christ, but instead follow Pope Martin's example of courage and faith. Fearlessly confess our belief in Christ, stand up for the truth, defend his position of primacy uh, over all of the powers of the world. Uh, you know, even the power of our own desires, right? It's not what I want. It's what God wants and what the church wants. And, and uh, above all, uh, let's pray. Let's pray for this grace of courage to be given to our whole, our popes, our bishops, and ourselves, right in these times, right where everybody seems to be struggling with the virtues of courage and public defense of the church. So let us pray to Saint Martin uh, for that grace. God bless you all in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.